Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if we'd like to begin, welcome back. My name is Chris McCarthy, and welcome to this session with uh, Professor Lorimer Mosley and Professor Tim Watson. If you'd like to uh, turn your phones on, get the apps up, put it on vibrate. If you go into the session, you'll see there's an abstract, and at the end of the, the bottom of that page, there is a, a method of rating the session, so we can have your feedback on the session. So uh, as the session goes on, if you'd like to feedback, then please use the app, and of course, add your questions. They'll pop up on the iPad over there. We can prioritize them for the end of the session with uh, Professor Mosley. So let's begin by introducing our first speaker. So I have to get the glasses, first time ever. One of the reading glasses, God. So most of you will have, will have at least heard Lorimer, you may have met him, he's um, one of the stars of uh, musculoskeletal practice in my mind. He's done, he's done a fantastic course pre-conference, the feedback from that course has been amazing. We're very lucky to have him. Uh, he's a clinical and research physiotherapist, he's a uh, principal research fellow, has a PhD in medicine from the University of Sydney. Uh, was the Nuffield Fellow at Oxford University in the UK and is a Professor of Clinical Neurosciences uh, and the Foundation Chair in Physiotherapy at the University of South Australia, uh, the Neuroscience Research uh, Institute in Australia in Sydney. He's authored over 180 papers. Um, he's uh, one of the chief editors of the Body and Mind uh, website and group. Uh, he's an exceptional speaker. We're very lucky to have him. And can I welcome on stage Professor Laura Mosley? Thanks, Chris. Water. Uh, no, I think I'm all right. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Cool. So, uh, welcome to the second session. What a, what a privilege it is to follow Anne and Gwen uh, and uh, to be part of this community. I haven't been to this meeting for a, a little while, uh, but it does feel like a reunion. So all those people I'm seeing when I'm running past saying, I think they're worried about my slides not arriving, which was about 15 minutes ago, uh, I intend to catch up. Um, Thank you for inviting me to be part of, of IFOMT uh, and uh, it's slightly intimidating for me because I'm not a manual therapist. Uh, is that okay? <laughs> uh, however, I'll, uh, uh, I, I do find humans very, very fascinating uh, and particularly I find myself quite fascinating and uh, I often find myself saying something and then thinking, why did I say that? Does anyone else relate to that? Where, yeah? And I find other humans even more fascinating than me. So uh, it's a good field to be in when you're dealing with people with pain, and my particular interest is people with chronic pain. As a scientist, I'm convinced that it is impossible to know what you're thinking uh, you, you, and why you're thinking things. So you need to be very careful uh, to identify and eliminate as many of the biases as you can. Uh, I think it's really important for all of you to know what conflicts I bring into this room and I bring into my career. Uh, so I'd like you to take a look at my disclosures. Now normally when you're at a conference, it, it works like this. Uh, and here are my disclosures. Oh, people, that didn't go fast enough. I'll try it again. Here are my disclosures. Oh, that's very slow, isn't it? Anyway, they don't show them long enough in my view. Uh, I have conflicts of interest here, so uh, over the last six years or so, there are some of the organisations uh, who have supported my travel, if you like, to a meeting, uh, who might have paid me a bit of money, and that will come into my research decision making, and I can't help that because I have a very complex brain, and so does everyone, uh, and the influences that are behind what we think and what we decide are sometimes very difficult to grasp and to see. Relevant to that is this question, and I guess the brief that I was given was really along these lines of, let's get the pain biology into patient care. 
But I'm also really interested in what is the biology uh, that's, that's sitting underneath patient care, so a two-way relationship. And this is a series of studies that I was really excited by when I did my undergraduate physiotherapy degree. Uh, and I've constructed the next images based on, primarily on this review, but a whole, a whole body of work by Braithwaite and Cooper, looking at analgesia with placebos. And this would be the amount of analgesia uh, you get if you give someone an aspirin or a placebo. Uh, and this would be the amount of analgesia you get if you do nothing at all, which will, should make our training in, in the clinical sciences a bit easier because we could just teach people how to do nothing at all and we would still have uh, uh, an, an effect of some, some kind. We're better off branding the aspirin. So if we put the aspirin in a branded box, we're going to get a better result than if it's not branded. But not surprisingly, if we brand the placebo, we also get a better response. So if we're doing a completely inert intervention, we should brand it. Give it a brand. <laughs> because we'll have a more, uh, a more substantial analgesic effect. So what Braithwaite and Cooper suggested, and there's a very large body of research now to replicate their work and, and really to consolidate it, to suggest that whenever anyone gets pain relief, there are different contributors to their pain relief, ranging from natural history, that would, is just what would happen anyway, the drug effect, in here it's in orange, uh, the act of taking a pill has an effect. And this is the thing that really sparked my interest. I thought, really? Why does the act of taking a pill have an effect? and the brand effect. So that's an analgesic mediator, which I think is really, really interesting. And just so you know that this is not just a few studies, I don't expect anyone to necessarily be able to read that, uh, but the point of this is, is to illustrate just how much research there is here. Each of the rows of this column talk about groups of studies. For example, uh, this one of them up there is an analysis of 416 randomised placebo-controlled trials. Right, so this is a massive about, amount of research underpinning some of these sorts of findings of the effects of inert treatments. And here's some of the things that come out which I think are interesting. If you inject an inert molecule, it will have a greater effect than if you swallow that inert molecule. Uh, capsules are better than tablets. Capsules that you can see into and have lots of little red balls in them are better than capsules you can't see into. Capsules delivered with the left hand are more effective. No, that's not true. Uh, okay, I went a bit too far, too far. So here we can compare exactly the same molecule, both in the active treatment and in the inert treatment. The same treatment, delivered in two different ways, has a different impact. I think this is quite interesting. Can you raise your hand if you believe that you are a better than average therapist? <laughs> it's only the men who put their hand up. That was interesting. Very interesting. So let's apply this to some of what we do. For example, two clinicians do exactly the same treatment. Now, this is extremely unlikely, actually. But let's just pretend for a moment that that could happen. And one clinician gets a better analgesic effect than the other clinician. I hope you'll agree that that's a, a reasonable possibility. So let's say these are the two clinicians. Uh, on, on one side, we have someone who's getting a, a, quite a large treatment effect here. And then on the other side, we have someone who's having a small treatment effect. And as far as I can see from the literature, in most of what we do, not just in physiotherapy, but really across uh, the interactive treatment disciplines, most of what we do, the actual thing we do, has a small effect. But the change in someone's life is potentially quite large. So the package that we are delivering or engaging in can be really effective, but the, the thing we're labelling it, the part of that that we're pinning everything on, has a small effect. And I think that the, I believe the data are pretty compelling to justify that position. And it's tempting for us to call all of that green stuff there that's not uh, natural history, the placebo effect. Now I think placebo is a daft idea actually 
Because what it's saying is that there is an effect of an inert thing. And inert things don't have effects. So this is a nonsense phrase, if you like. And I think, I think placebo effects don't actually exist. I don't think there is actually a placebo effect. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. We now have empirical data that suggests that the better looking you are, the better your analgesic effect. Uh, so we have one clinician here with dashing good looks and the other clinician, I showed the photo of the other clinician to my 14-year-old uh, daughter and she said, did they know that you took that photo? <laughs> I said, really? Charlotte, have a good look at that. She's confused and then I had to go and she understood straight away. There's empirical data that the, the perceived intelligence of your clinician, their eloquence, their expertise, affects pain relief of whatever they do. So hopefully you can see the, plus, the thing we thought was the placebo effect is getting smaller. And the only reason it's getting smaller is that we're understanding more of the interactions that are happening and the cues that have some sort of meaning to, to the brain of the person who is suffering, if you like. What about the clinician on the left who sort of drops their Mercedes-Benz keys on the table in front of you? Can I help you? And then you notice there's also a set of BMW keys on the same key ring and you're thinking, wow, they must be good. Or the person on the other side who has their push scooter in the back of the office. Doesn't really instill you with confidence. Now, I don't know of empirical data that compares the analgesic effect of owning a Mercedes or a push scooter, but the principle, I hope you agree, is there. What well, a fashion sense. Well, this is, uh, I managed to get a photograph of the, uh, the clinician on your right there in his very nice gear. And I, apart from my very nice shirt, someone's already complimented me on my shirt today. I really don't think I, I make it as far as Chris does. And this is the study that I remains my favourite study. It was published in an obscure magazine called Nature and it was a double blind placebo controlled trial of fentanyl which is a powerful analgesic. So getting a powerful analgesic after a wisdom tooth removal. But they played a trick on the dentists. So what they actually did, and I quite love the idea of uh, a double blind dental trial, like imagine a blind dentist. <laughs> That would be pretty disturbing as a patient, you know, you're going warmer, warmer, warmer. <laughs> that would be really hard. But what they did in this trial is that they randomly allocated the dentist to two different types of information. And one group of dentists was told, we're really sorry, but we have no fentanyl for you. You're going to be injecting the placebo, but don't let the patient know. And the other group were told the truth. So just to, to make that clear, both groups of dentists had a 50% chance of injecting placebo, an inert thing. But one group thought they had a 100% chance of doing something that doesn't work. I hope, that, I hope you can see what's happening there. And then they looked at the effect of the placebo injection on pain relief, and these are the two groups. And hopefully you can see that if the dentists think what they do, they're doing is no chance of being an active drug, pain gets worse on a 10 point scale by about three points after the injection. If they think there's a 50% chance it's fentanyl, pain gets two points better on a 10 point scale. That's a five point turnaround attributable to the dentist's belief that what they're going to do might have an effect. I think that's remarkable. I think that is a remarkable finding, made, made more remarkable by uh, showing third parties, showing someone else the video interaction and asking them, tell me which group you think the dentist is in. And they can't guess. They can't work it out. So the onlooker can't see any of the cues that are being delivered that end up providing analgesia. And I reckon that is astounding. And all of us do highly interactive treatments. So that makes me think, wow, what are the cues that we are delivering that is changing that person's brain's production of pain? And this finding still motivates me to learn more about pain and how it works. So we've done a bit of research trying to look at these non-nociceptive cues that modulate pain. 
Here's a study we did some time ago. We got supposedly normal, healthy volunteers, and I always have to say supposedly normal uh, because they are volunteering for a pain experiment. Uh, clearly, they're not normal. If, if you were living in Oxford 10 years ago, you might have walked past one of the community notice boards, had a sign saying, uh, participants wanted for a pain experiment. Ring this number. So just raise your hand if you would ring the number. A few of you I can see there. Careful. You come into the lab and, and we would explain it to you. Well, we're going to put a helmet on your head. It's like a swimming cap with lots of electrodes. Uh, there's 64 electrodes and we just need to prick the skin enough to make it bleed at each of those electrode sites. Who's still in for that? <laughs> and then once we've got that, you'll fill out some questionnaires and then we'll randomly allocate you to one of two groups. Now, one group will receive an injection of very salty water into the muscles of their pelvic floor. <laughs> now that's going to give you moderate to intense abdominal and lumbar spine pain for about 20 minutes and you've got a 50% chance of pooing yourself. <laughs> Who at the end of that says, I am in? <laughs> Great. The Spanish man. <laughs> Bring back the Inquisition, I say. So these are not, health, these are not normal people. So uh, in this experiment, we got supposedly normal healthy volunteers, and we put a very cold thermode on the back of their hand. And then we, uh, we didn't tell them anything about this cue, but we gave them either a, a light blue light or a red light at the same time as they received that cue. And the theory behind that is that the red light means something. It means hot. We have primary nociceptors in the tissues, and some of those nociceptors are responsive to changes in temperature up or down. So they're bidirectional thermal nociceptors. So they will be activated uh, when you put the very cold thermode on the back of the hand. But our theory is that the red light will be a cue to the brain to say this is hot and we know that hot is more dangerous than cold. That's the theory behind this. That's the other light, a light blue light appears and we asked a lot of questions but these are the data that are most relevant here. Let's get my laser pointer. So these are individual data and hopefully you can see that uh, when people see the red light it hurts more than if they see the blue light but the nociceptive stimulus is identical in those two scenarios. And if you look carefully, you can see some people, like this person here. That person there is clearly an idiot. <laughs> because they are not picking up on the sensory cue that has meaning for protection. <laughs> this is a study we did more recently. So this is work out of the PhD uh, of Daniel Harvey, Dr. Daniel Harvey, who's an, an outstanding innovator uh, and scientists. So really keep an eye out for, for Harvey et al because there's going to be some great papers by him over the course of his career. In this experiment, we were particularly interested in whether we could use a vibrotactile stimulus to change the pain of a noxious stimulus delivered on the same area. So this is the setup. Someone's rating the unpleasantness and intensity of the, uh, the painful stimulus, which in this one, I think, was an electrical stimulus. Little electrodes just beneath the surface of the skin. But we are interested in pain in different contexts. What, what this tells us is that the really painful stimulus hurts more than the not painful stimulus. This is not, as my daughter would have said 10 years ago, that's hardly rocket surgery, Dad. Well, that's true. But this small difference here is what happens when we test a... a, a a moderate noxious stimulus in conjunction with one of those two vibrotactile stimuli. And this is a very small difference, but we are in a very contrived situation in the lab, and it's a statistically uh, important, if you like, significant. It's small, but it's there to show that non-noxious cues delivered at the same time, and this one shows that, delivered at the same time as the noxious cue modulate up and down according to past experience. So according to associative learning or Pavlov's classical conditioning theory. Now this may not be very surprising to, to you people, 
In fact, we now know, Dr. Tori Madden's PhD, uh, many, some of you would have, have been involved in her PhD because she had a survey asking people, do you think it's possible to condition pain, classically condition pain? And clinicians overwhelmingly say yes. However, until this study was published, there was no clear evidence to support that perspective. So we would ask people, do you think that's possible? Yes, and, and I think it's really interesting and dem demonstrative of the wisdom of clinical groups that clinicians say yes, because it's so consistent with what we see in the clinic. It looks like that's an associatively learnt experience. Well, now we can say, well, uh, this probably does happen. Certainly, we can make it happen in the lab with supposedly normal healthy volunteers. This is one of Tori's studies. So Tori Mannon, who's now at the University of Cape Town as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, in this study, we looked at laser stimuli. So I'm just going to give you an idea of what laser feels like. Can you all open your eyes really wide? No, I won't really do that. But laser uh, stimulates nociceptors in the skin. And in Tori's study, again, we just had two different vibrotactile stimuli. Here, they're labelled tactors. We had a third that was for generalisation. And we compared what, what is the pain that is evoked, or in her study, it was looking at pain thresholds. What is the pain threshold when you couple it with a previous, with a previous stimulus that was always associated with a highly noxious import? So Dan's study shows hyperalgesia, classically conditioned hyperalgesia. Tori's study shows classically conditioned allodynia. So pain where we would not have had pain before. And these two boxes point that out. And for anyone in an ethics committee, you can see in the third, we're able to extinguish that very quickly so there's no longer an effect. Here's another one of Dan's studies. And he's moving forward with this really exciting research. But in this study, we were interested in whether visual cues that tell you your head is rotating are important for triggering pain during head rotation, during neck rotation. This is the setup. So this is a virtual reality goggles. And that picture that you can see demonstrates what the person will be seeing as they turn their head. Inside those goggles are goniometers telling us what is the true rotation. And then we can manipulate the speed at which the visual field shifts so that they are no longer congruent. And Dan has uh, published a, a paper, I think, in physical therapy, looking at this as a detector of proprioceptive uh, precision and acuity. What these data show is that there is a, uh, a gain between about 0.7 and 1.2 at which people cannot detect that there is incongruence between vision and proprioception. They, they don't realise that we've, we've messed with their feedback. And vision is the most precise and therefore the most influential sensory system we've got. So vision is normally winning. So we know that if we are able to get people moving in that level of gain, they don't know that we're tricking them. I hope that makes sense. And these are the data from patients with chronic neck pain when they turn their head. So on the left, uh, people are able to move further because their visual field uh, is moving more slowly than their, than their true movement. So their visual cues are saying you haven't moved as far as you have and there is no pain. So this is the, the onset of pain. And in red, it's movement allodynia. When we make the vision move more quickly, then pain comes on earlier. So th these chronic pain patients their pain is being triggered, at least in part, by, by visual feedback of rotation, not nociception. That would be our, our interpretation of these results. And it's not just pain. So pain's one of our protective outputs, but there's other outputs that are modulated by non-noxious cues. And I think these studies are really groovy and really, really relevant to the experience that I had in the elevator this morning in the hotel. Because what these people did was look at the effect of a disgusting smell on a nociceptive withdrawal reflex. Now, I walked into the elevator this morning, and if you're here, the person who walked out, I hope you realise I know what you did in there. <laughs> it was really, really quite rank and, and disgusting. So bad that, you know, when you know someone else has farted in the elevator and then leaves, and then another person comes in. <laughs> so if you are here, please know it was not me. <laughs> I guarantee it was not me. 
Uh, in this study, these, these people were looking at the EMG response to a noxious stimulus as a classic nociceptive withdrawal reflex. But they also gave them smells. And the box there shows that smelling a disgusting odour and then getting a noxious input that you know is going to happen increases your withdrawal from that input. Now, I, I think this is quite a profound finding, actually. And Sarah Walwork, who's just finished her PhD in our group, has done a systematic review and meta-analysis of all of these kinds of protective reflexes and shown quite clearly that the biggest modulator is our cues that tell you you need to protect a bit more. So the biggest modulator of protective cues, uh, of protective reflexes, seem to be danger-related cues. And they don't have to be specific to the body part at all. So in this experiment, these supposedly normal healthy volunteers are in a disgusting environment and their, their brain upregulates nociceptive withdrawal reflex. I think that's really cool. Here's another study done by Sarah in collaboration with uh, Professor Gian Domenico Alessandro Magnifico Fantastico Perfetto Ionetti from University College London, and it uses the hand blink reflex. It's a really groovy reflex. If you stimulate the median nerve, you blink. 75% of people will blink. Uh, until about three years ago, it was presumed that this was a standalone, very basic protective response left over from evolutionary processes under brainstem control. And if you cut off your head, you'd still have this, although it'd be hard to test whether you blinked, I guess. What, uh, what Jando and Sarah have shown, uh, Jando showed this particular finding, is that this, this reflex is bigger if your hand is near your face. So the circuitry is identical, but the spatial data is such that the brain upregulates this protective response because your hand is near your face. If your hand is moving away from your face, that upregulation is gone. So how cool is that? It's like the brain is saying, well, you're moving away, it doesn't matter, I don't need to protect as much. If you're moving towards your face, it's upregulated early. So this is a predictive, feed-forward, protective modulation of a reflex that we presumed was just a spinal, or a, a brainstem equivalent of a spinal reflex. But here's the cool part. What these guys have also shown is that if you put a barrier between your hand and your face, that upregulation is lost. So the cognitive input knowing, well, there's a protection between where the stimulus is occurring and the eye is enough to stop the brain from increasing protection. Unless it's a weak barrier. If you put a piece of tissue up there, the brain still reinstates this protection. So this is real-time, highly sophisticated cognitive processing changing basic reflexes. Here's a cool study. This is not published yet, and I really hope that uh, Tasha Stanton, who is an, is, is an outstanding young researcher in, in our group, probably not as young now, mid-career researcher, uh, is winning all the prizes that she's eligible for from the International Association for the Study of Pain, from the Australian government. She's an absolute, uh, absolute cracker. And she thought of this idea. Where we'd previously spoken about stiffness like we speak about pain. And people often say, well, I feel like I've got a stiff back, I've got a stiff knee. And that feeling of stiffness. And uh, an old supervisor of her called Greg Korchuk has got this amazing, uh, incredible indentor that measures the stiffness of the lumbar spine. What Tasha and Greg have shown is that true stiffness of the lumbar spine doesn't match felt stiffness. So they're... they're Felt stiffness does not depend on true stiffness. But what Tasha thought she'd do is, what happens if we put the indentation, synchronise it with the sound of a creaky door? A non-noxious and in many ways ridiculous cue associated with stiffness. Which is what Tasha did. The difference between these two is the perceived stiffness, so how stiff does your back feel, when you're listening to a creaky door in conjunction with the indentations, which is on the right, versus when you're listening to a, a swooshy sound. Now in science, these swooshy sounds are called swooshy sounds. <laughs> but hopefully you can see this is a really profound difference in these two scenarios. This is called cross-modal modulation, and 
I think, points to a highly sophisticated modulatory system for even feeling stiffness. How much more so should we be able to modulate that if we, if we intentionally target with sophisticated cognitive strategies? And I think there's a lot, of, a lot of excitement that comes out of a study like this. And all of this leads into what's officially known as the grand poobah pain theory. That pain is, is the unpleasant feeling that's felt somewhere in the body that urges us to protect that body part. And what's happening in the pain sciences now is, is a, quite a rapid journey towards pain being about protection. It's all about protective behaviour. It's not about the state of the tissues. And actually, even in highly controlled experiments, nociception is not even about the state of the tissues. Nociception is about triggering protective responses. Even in highly controlled experiments, nociception is not about the state of the tissues. It's about triggering protective responses. Pain is an output, not an input. Many of you would have heard me say this before and others say this before. This is not my idea at all. It's just the idea that I think is most sensible. Uh, so I spent a lot of time putting together a schematic to capture this highly complex distinction. Pain doesn't come into the brain. Pain comes into consciousness from the human. And we might say it's the brain that produces pain, but that wouldn't really be correct. It's the human that produces pain. But the brain is the obvious uh, big kahuna organ that contributes to that, I guess. And it's only one of our protective mechanisms. And there are other protective mechanisms that are happening all the time. Now, as, as a physical therapist, we know movement, right? We know movement. I think Anna, the beautiful Anna with whom I share my life, I think she might have fallen in love with me because the first time we went out, I was able to pick that she had an old ankle injury. And you know, everyone's had an old ankle injury, haven't they? And I was able to say, oh, hurt your ankle when you were younger. <laughs> she's quite a lot shorter than me, which is why she's doing that. So if anyone is lonely, <laughs> the best way to secure a life partner is bring up the old ankle injury thing. So, and then when they say, that's amazing, you say, I'm a physiotherapist. And I promised someone, I hate to do this, but I have promised someone six months ago that I would demonstrate for you the thing that we love the most as physical therapists, that we know we can do better than anyone else on the planet, the pelvic tilt. <laughs> and we just long for that patient to come in who's got chronic low back pain. Because we know, we'll say, now, how, how are you, Martha? How's your back? Oh, I've got 20 years of back. Whatever, Martha. Do you want to see my pelvic tilt? <laughs> And Martha says, what is it? And you say, it's just a pelvic tilt. <laughs> and Martha's eyes drop out. She says, can you do that again? I'm sure, I have no worries, I can do a pelvic tilt. <laughs> In fact, when you go and look at the, go down to the Glasgow Main Street, you can sit and just spot all the other IFOM delegates because they walk around like this. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> thanks. So the, the motor system is the system that's almost like our currency. We can see when the motor system is protective. And some of, of what uh, Gwen went through this morning I thought was just, just terrific, it, looking at when this uh, realisation that returning things to functional limits might have a serious, uh, a serious part in our management of patients. And the motor system is the one that I grew up in, if you like. I did my PhD under the walking cortex, well, actually now the running cortex, Paul Hodges, uh, who apparently tried to forget something a few years ago and he couldn't do it. But. <laughs> but there are other systems that are relevant to us and they're becoming more and more relevant and I want to convince you of that. This is a book, uh, a picture out of a book by David Butler and I called Explain Pain, trying to capture all the other protective mechanisms that are at play. Uh, when the brain concludes that that's in our best interest. It's not just pain, but hopefully you will see the wording here uh, that we subscribe to is the pain production system. The pain production system. Because pain is the only one that we are necessarily aware of. You can't have pain and not know about it. You can have a shift in interleukin-4 
You can have a cortisol shift, you can probably shift your heart rate, your respiratory rate, without knowing, but you can't have pain and not know about it. So where does it fit? So we would argue that nociception is what happens in the nerves and in the immune mechanisms, in pathways that take danger messages to your brain. Pain is what is produced into consciousness. And it's modulated by any credible evidence of threat, and I think the, the data are now really compelling to say that that is the case. So here are some discoveries that I think should rock your world in the next decade, and I imagine there will be a chapter or two in Greaves 2025 that in, incorporates these discoveries that I think are critical to us as physical therapists. This is a really bad drawing that I did in somewhat of a hurry, but it's meant to capture the spinal nociceptor here, running up to the thalamus, primary nociceptors coming into that synapse, and these are immune cells, glia or astrocytes, and this is Homer Simpson. I have to explain that for Marge. If you're here, Marge, this is what Homer Simpson looks like. And Homer Simpson is, is representing a toll-like receptor. And rather than go into all of that, uh, just know that this synapse cannot work without the glial cell. The synapse is useless without the glial cell. And the, the glial cell keeps this running in a highly simplified sense by the balance between pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines that, it, that they are releasing. And they do that in response to activation or, or a disturbance in the synapse. Homer is really important because Homer, the toll-like receptor 4, is a, is a moron. It's a moronic receptor, but it's got a very long memory, and that's really important to us as clinicians. Because now, in that neuroimmune space, uh, and I work closely with a guy called Mark Hutchinson, who's right into this. He's a neuropharmacoimmunologist, or something like that. Uh, he's a nice guy as well. And we're now recognising that the toll-like receptor will respond to particular molecular patterns associated with damage or danger, called DAMPs, pathogens, viruses, bacteria, toxins. We call them PAMPs. And anything that's foreign, maybe not foreign substances, most obviously morphine. And we call that a ZAMP, a xenobiotic associated molecular pattern. That's really important for us, not just at the spinal level, but in the brain. So in the brain, these immune cells interact very tightly. 90% of the brain are immune cells. And they interact very tightly in our thinking uh, and in our conductance uh, in an electrophysical sense. Mark would even go so far, and this is hard to get out of animal studies, but would go so far as to say that there are cognition-associated molecular patterns. So the things that you think affect your immune activation. And that's, that's well established in a basic sense from animal studies. Uh, and Mark would describe it as uh, our immune cells move towards a thought. Now, there's, there's a pretty strong speculation license with that, but hopefully you can get the idea of that that when we think we are in danger, it's a reasonable prediction to say that our immune system upregulates in response to that thought. That's a reasonable prediction that has not been shown, but I expect that by 2025, that might be the case. I've got a newfound respect for nociceptive wiring. So here's a simplified schematic of the nociceptive system. Uh, but if we look more closely at the, just at the dorsal horn, the dorsal horn in humans uh, and in animals, has a massive computational capacity. Absolutely massive. Uh, there are thousands of intraspinal interneurons involved in a nociceptive transmission and in modulation by higher centres. There's lots of different types. The, the image on your left here gives you an idea of the influence of a single incoming neuron at the dorsal horn level. It's massive. And I would now say that it's like the brain starts there, primarily concerned with spatial and magnitude computations. I think this should rock our world as well. What we now know about glia is that they become primed. They, they remember, and this is where Homer Simpson, the moron, comes in. The more they are exposed to these damps, pamps, zamps, and possibly camps, then the more primed they get for when there is a, a, a nociceptive signal running past, such that over life we can have tiny immune insults associated with any of those things 
that mean that ultimately when the nociceptive system is activated, the pain that emerges is out of kilter with the nociceptive stimulus. So this is priming before the injury and I think that this will, will really change our world. There's another one of Mark's, so uh, I really like this slide because it reminds us that, that we can't just think about the body as a machine. We also have to think about the body as a garden. Uh, and if you imagine a garden, when something goes wrong with your tomatoes, then all of a sudden something's happening with your asparagus on the other side. And we don't understand some of those connections. They're not like hardwired connections. There's a lot of influence. We are a single organism. I think that's becoming really, really clear. And old things uh, still ring true. So uh, George Engel proposed the biopsychosocial model in 1960. This is almost 60 years ago. And all of the research is really pointing us more and more towards that. And I completely concur again uh, with what Gwen said this, this morning about a truly biopsychosocial approach to people uh, who are in trouble. But this is the wisdom of George Engel, I guess. It is no more valid to attribute the entirety of a shift in human state to an isolated cell or tissue event than it is to isolate that cell or tissue and expect it, once removed, to generate the same signs and symptoms that were present before it was removed. This is nonsense. And, and, and this is one of George's uh, quotes. But the biopsychosocial model itself has been corrupted, I think, over time and has been misplaced. Up here you can see the original from Fordyce's application in the pain field. This is John Loesch's version. This is uh, what David Butler and I uh, did just to the same thing, and this has got limitations and inaccuracies. And isn't it intriguing that Dave and I are out of focus? I really do feel that at the moment in life. I just feel... No, I don't. Uh, this is from the... Uh, I got this off Google, Children's Mercy Hospital, I think in Kansas or uh, somewhere in the States, because I really like that. I'll come back to that. But here's some situations from Google where it's been stuffed up. This is not the biopsychosocial model uh, of pain. Here they've got biological is the intensity and nature of pain, psychology, the distress that it brings, and sociology, the effect on daily functioning. That's not how the biopsychosocial model fits, according to George, and how it's been applied in other fields. Nor is this. Biological, the bodily symptoms. Psychological, how you feel about them. And social, how it affects your relationships. That's not the biopsychosocial model. But clearly, the biopsychosocial model does reject the biomedical model. This is from George. The first part's from George. Because the biomedical model, by definition, is not, is not concerned with the person. But the biopsychosocial model does not reject the role of structural, biomechanical and functional disturbance of body tissue as potentially powerful drivers of protection. It's integrated. And have a look at this one from the Children's Mercy Hospital. I love this. This is talking about chronic abdominal pain. Some of the biological things that are relevant, what's happening in your viscera, in your nerves, uh, inflammation, bacteria in the gut your mood, anxiety, your beliefs, your relationships, but critically, they are all influencing each other. That's the difference. There's a constant interplay going on. Relevant to that is this idea of the cortical body matrix, uh, which is a conceptual idea linking the things we feel and what happens in your body. And I want to give you an example of a couple of these things. Sorry about that little extra... There it is. Can you all do this, please? I want you to do that. And then I want you to move your hand right over there as far as you can. Go right back the other way. And now can you go from there to there, but do it the short way. <laughs> right, we can't do that, right? We can't, it's impossible for us. But what about if you, hadn't, if you didn't have an arm, but you had a phantom? This is an experiment that we did in seven amputees with an intact phantom, and we said, can you learn how to do that impossible movement? And four of them said yes, and rather than talk you through this, you could look at the paper, but uh, these are the four who said yes on one of our tests you can't cheat on, and these are the four who said yes on our other tests you can't cheat on. That tells us that they were telling the truth when they said, I can do it. But all of them, simultaneously to learning the movement, changed the felt structure of their phantom. And here's the drawing that one of them gave. Simultaneously, how our body feels 
and what we can do with it change. And I think that's really, really interesting for us. What was interesting about this as well is that these people lost the ability to do this with their phantom because they all now had an access through their hand that couldn't let them do it, which I reckon is quite, quite amazing. Okay. Sorry, I've got a very slow thing here. Maybe you could help me out there, Kevin. What about touch? So this is an experiment we did with uh, just a small number of people with low back pain who we asked to draw how they felt their back to be, the outline of their back. And then we measured two-point uh, discrimination threshold. And, and when this fellow got to here, he said, I can't feel it anymore. I can't find it. And that was the point where tactile acuity was low, but sensory detection was normal. So there's a problem with representations in the brain. Same thing happened with the next five people who came in, and the title of this paper was I can't find it because everyone said that or words to that effect. This is a situation where we are interested in, in how important is it that you have a sense of ownership over your body. So this is a postdoc in my lab when I was in the UK uh, and he's doing the rubber hand illusion which gives you a compelling illusion that you can feel a touch on this rubber hand even though you're actually getting touched here but you can see the touch on this. Uh, these, these studies were done by a group of Dutch students who came over to spend uh, some time in our lab. Uh, and they were outstanding, and I had the pleasure of running into one of them yesterday who's at this conference. So shout out to Sonica and, and welcome. Uh, what these studies showed is that when you get the rubber hand illusion, your own hand behind the, the board goes cold. You get a reduction in blood flow to that hand that's very specific to that hand. So the, the sense of ownership or representation of what your arm feels like changes blood flow to your arm. This shows that it also increases histamine reactivity. So if you get a rubber hand illusion, you become more reactive to immune insults in the limb. So how you feel about your hand affects your immune responses to protect your hand. This study here shows that if you have complex regional pain syndrome and you watch your arm while you move it, it hurts. Nothing very surprising. But if you watch your arm through magnifying glasses, it hurts more when it looks big. When it looks swollen, it hurts more. But the cool part, it gets more swollen. When you're watching your arm, if you've got CRPS and your arm is becoming swollen, if you make that swelling look worse, your swelling gets worse. And we did the control experiments. It's not because of how they move. And if you're wondering what happens when you turn the binoculars upside down, the effect is reduced. So the increase in swelling is reduced. So a clear two-way relationship between what it looks like and what it's doing. OK, what I'd like to do, Kevin, this would take me a long time. Can you take me to my uh, fourth last slide, please? Okay, so can you go back two, please, Kevin? Great. Okay, one more. So this is skipped through to my uh, my last slides because I'm running out of time. And I, I'll, the beauty of doing another talk on Thursday is that I can f flip them into that, uh, which means I have to do less preparation between now and then, which is cool. I think the evidence is telling us, and this is relevant to patient care, that that pain itself is truly biopsychosocial. It's modulated by any credible evidence that you need protection. In a biological framework, the state of the tissues, inflammatory set, bacteria, pathogens, cognitions, xenobiotics, most obviously morphine, all of that affects the, the compulsion to protect. And the only thing that compels us to protect with real vigor is pain, possibly stiffness. But we're now learning that the same thing is, is happening with stiffness. We know, and there's a workshop this afternoon, uh, and I'll talk more about this on Thursday, we, we know there is empirical data, level one evidence, that understanding this truly biopsychosocial phenomenon that is pain is good. It improves outcomes. Pain, disability, and function outcomes. And I, I would argue that there is very clear evidence that reassurance, sophisticated reassurance, and explaining pain has a clear role in our interventions, and we are obliged to make sure that all our explanations of what we do are consistent with what we currently know about what we do. 
It seems that we have an internal protection meter that's modulated at, at all times in real time. And it's only when that internal protection meter reaches a threshold that we get pain. And it depends on a balance between danger and safety cues and we can exploit that clinically. And the pathophysiological findings associated with chronic pain now extend to inflammation mediated changes in the brain. I'll talk about that on Thursday uh, and what we might be able to do about it. So to conclude, I'd like to really thank the people in my research group who do excellent work. I'm fortunate enough to, to work with clever, kind and community-minded people. Some of these people in yellow uh, up the top have now moved on. They're now postdocs in other labs, uh, but I want to particularly shout out to Dan, Dan Harvey, who I've mentioned, Tasha Stanton, Tori Madden and Emily Reid. Uh, and I collaborate closely with the people uh, in white. This is a photograph from our last group retreat where a few of us got together to drink wine in the Clare Valley and were lucky enough to be joined by Gian Domenico Alessandro, Magnifico Fantastico Perfetto Ionetti and Frank Keefe. <laughs> now my last thing is this, do yourself a favour and come to Australia next April for the Pain Revolution uh, ride. We're riding from Melbourne to Adelaide over uh, six days and along the way at each of those sites we are running uh, pain education for GPs, physiotherapists, psychologists uh, and the public. Uh, so if you come uh, along with us, you can then go to the Australian Pain Society meeting the very next week in Adelaide. Seven days, 880k, two day explained pain course, five public pain seminars, five multidisciplinary workshops you can be a part of. Strictly limited to 30 riders, so you have to get in early to be part of that. Uh, and this is our objective, to raise money for the Pain Revolution Foundation to raise awareness of the problem, provide knowledge, provide skills, consolidate those gains and measure those outcomes. So uh, do yourself a favour, if you're a cyclist of any description or you want to be one, get in touch with Tracy. Thank you very much for my rushed ending, allowing me to have my rushed ending, but thank you very much. Thanks.